back to where I was, where I was going. I want to just look into the, in, so like into the mind of the enemy. If you're going to know his schemes, you got to, you got to understand him a little bit. There is a guy who lived, uh, gosh, I think around the fifth century B.C. before Christ. You may have heard of him. His name was Sun Tzu, a Chinese a diplomat, a mm -hmm. Chinese general, a Chinese warrior, who wrote a book called The Art of War. Mm -hmm. And that is still commonly used, by the way, it's, it's used frequently in China. Okay? Um, Makes sense. Yeah, because it is, it is the methodology of victory in war, as they see it. Right? It's also used in the, wet, in the West a lot today, because it's still seen. So, but this is worldly wisdom, right? Because remember, there's two different kinds of wisdom. It talks about this in James. It says that there is wisdom from above, mm -hmm. and then there is wisdom, which is earthly, natural, and demonic. Yes. Sun Tzu said that warfare is the way of deception. Mm -hmm. If your enemy is united, separate them. Mm -hmm. okay. So he knows this is an important Vision. tactic. Divide your enemy. Mm -hmm. Why? He, Jesus said it. A house divided cannot stand. All right. Let me just share one more personal thing with you, and I know I, I think in different Bible studies I, I probably have shared this with you before. Um, a, a few years back, I was over in West Africa. I was in Cameroon in the capital one day, and I was uh, preaching and teaching at a large conference in the capital city of Cameroon. And uh, the camp, the conference was like a week long. And on the last night of the conference, I had been teaching a group of pastors, maybe 100 pastors, and they had come from all over Africa. They had actually come from Europe. There were some there from the, the Caribbean, mm -hmm. Caribbean, Caribbean. Uh, that place. Yeah, that place. <laughs> that place where it's nice and warm. And, well, that's a, <laughs> uh, so I was talking to all these pastors, and as I say, it was the last night. So the following day, they would all be packing up and going back to wherever they had come from. And it just struck me as I was talking to them. So I said, you know, I want to ask you a question. If you knew that tomorrow would be the last day you would ever spend on earth, mm -hmm. and you knew it with absolute certainty, how would that affect your prayer life today? And I asked these pastors, I said, take a minute and think about, consider the things that fill your prayers right now. Maybe you're praying, you know, about a new building. Maybe you're praying for God to fill up the pews. And think about whatever, whatever it is. And I'm not saying, you know, it's, what you're praying for is wrong or anything. But think about what you're praying for. And then think, if you knew that tomorrow was your last day on earth, how would that change your prayer life? That's a reasonable question. Yes, it is. You see, I, I believe then, and I believe it now, that such knowledge would change the prayers of most people. Yes. Now, I've been blessed to have had the opportunity to see this in action in my own life. You know, I was hit, we're talking about in Belize, I was hit one night by a speeding semi-truck on a lonely road in Central America. I was on foot and I got hit by a semi-truck. Uh, so, it, it should have killed me. I mean, you know, it is indeed a miracle that I lived through this because the two guys that were in the semi-truck that hit me were killed on the spot. And here I was on foot, and I got hit, and obviously, should be obvious, I survived. Yes. You know? But I would tell you that as I lay there, totally broken in body, on the side of this lonely road in Central America, it focused my prayer life. All of a sudden, I mean, I wasn't thinking about, okay, what am I going to be doing next week? You know, what do I, the things that I need? No, it changed, it gave me a very focused time of prayer, let me just say that. Things that have been very, very important only moments before, all of a sudden kind of faded off into insignificance. And it was only through that tremendous miracle at the hand of God that I'm, that I'm here to talk about this now. You know? So think about this on the night of the Passover, when Jesus had that last meal with his disciples and then went off to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's exactly what he faced. He knew with total assurance, remember he'd been talking about it, that it was his last night. He knew that it was over. He knew that his time had come for the cross. 
He prayed fervently. He prayed fervently to the point where he sweat blood praying, right? What he chose to pray for that night was for the unity of all of those the Father had given him, all of those who believed in him and his atoning work. John 17, I'm going to read verse 1 and, 11, 1 and verse 11. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. 